coming to you live from downtown Detroit. This is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Wednesday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel here with Joel Elkanen and Dennis Dick. Dust off your Dell VMware shoes because they are back in the news here. Maybe another spinoff or uh, outright uh, acquisition. We're not really sure, but Dell VMware back in the news overnight. Uh, We'll talk about that this morning. That's sort of like the big um, individual news. headline uh of the evening we have more uh trade headlines overnight at this time from uh or from the u.s as it pertains to europe and uh 3.1 billion dollars of new potential tariffs on european goods that's probably weighing on sentiment here this morning as well uh, our guest is paul Monica. he's a digital correspondent at cnn business he would join the show at 8 15. Let's bring on joel here now joel give us a quick update here on how we're doing in the overnight session Uh, We're in the red here, Spencer, by 22 handles. I had a little pop last night, got up to 31.2850. Really nothing there for you. Came back down through the open or through the close from yesterday at 18.50. And then that's where we picked up some steam to the downside. Pre-market low, 30.81. Don't have anything there for you folks. Yesterday's or you know, the, the crazy night Tuesday low was at uh, 3060. So still a ways to go from that level. Currently trading under 3100, down 22 and a half handles at 3096. Crude, give it a little back here, back under 40 bucks. We're looking at the August down 83 cents at 39.54. Gold knocking on the door of eighteen hundred, up nine dollars and fifty cents. Silver going the opposite way, down eight point eight cents at seventeen ninety seven and a half. And Bitcoin, and I don't think this thing ever gets out of the nine thousand handle. Uh, down three hundred and fifteen dollars at nine thousand three hundred and forty five. Let's bring in our arbitrageur expert, huh. uh, Triple D. What's going on? I, so- I don't know. Del Del VMware, man. I I this this is a complicated one. Are you uh are you attempting to tackle this arb? Uh yeah. Well, I've traded this arb for years, so um it's not surprising that eventually they were going to do something like this. I've traded this arb for years, and I've owned Dell for years for this main reason is that they've really always undervalued their VMware stake. The market has always significantly undervalued it. And I'll give you the reason. Dell market cap closed at 35.9 billion. They own over 50 billion worth of VMware. So if you just took that math, you'd say, well, they got, you know, they're valuing Dell, the rest of the company at minus $14 billion, which they are. But there's two implications. One, there's a lot of debt in Dell. Two, there's the tax consequences of a spinoff. So that's maybe, you know, a, a, a significant, like, like that could be significant. We know we saw with Yahoo and Alibaba that, you know, was an issue as well. So when, uh, when Yahoo owned all that Alibaba and they were trying to do the spinoff and trying to figure it out. So give us the news from last night, Spencer, on what broke right after the bell and why Dell and VMware yeah. are popping. Yeah, Dell is exploring options for as far as what to do with their 81% stake in VMware. So that could include a spinoff. Uh, It could include an acquisition of the rest of the company. We don't really know, but that's what the headline said. They are exploring options. They're exploring options to probably extract some value here because their stock has been significantly undervalued for years. So again, a full disclosure, I own Dell in the long-term portfolio. I've had it in there for a long time. It has been a dog for a long time. Um, I've been down in the position for a long time. I bought it back trying to remember i feel like i bought this back in like 20 like like shortly after like 2019 i guess it's when it came back out so i bought it back in 2019 just doing the and i think i'm in from around 56 or 57 dollars it had run to 70 and i was like always thinking that it was worth 80 to 90 because of their vmware position and um you know that never really came and then vmware obviously has come down in price from where it was in 2019 so that dell positions come down as well 
but you know, I still think, you know, that Dell is significantly undervalued and that's why I've owned it for a lot of years. It's just classic, you know, fundamental analysis saying that the holdings that they have are worth more than what they give the market price is giving it. So what do you do now? We, we don't know what they're exactly doing. Like you said, they're just exploring options. So what does this mean? They own, I believe it's 81% of VMware. So, and if you do the math on that, that's, uh, well, you can take 80, 80 percent of the market cap of VMware. What is that, Spencer? Do you have it in front of you? The market cap, current market cap of VMware. Well, I have yesterday's market well, cap. My market cap stats don't update until the actual trading day starts. So, as of their, yesterday, their, their stake is worth what uh, fifty billion dollars. Fifty billion at the close. Right. It was worth fifty billion dollars at the close. But now VMware is up another ten percent. So you could say it's sixty-eight. So now it's worth about fifty-five billion at the close. So Dell's up and rightfully so, because if they're going to spin this off, they obviously could get a chunk of money for it. The tax implications are going to make it less than that. So it, it's a little bit funky to figure out all the math. And But when you look at it here, look at this morning, Dell trading up six bucks. I think the move is justified. I've thought that for years that it's been undervalued. Now the VMware move is interesting because VMware pop in 13 points because Dell's going to spin off, the, potentially spin off the rest of their shares. I don't really see how that you know makes VMware worth 9% more, but I'm not going to argue with it if it wants to do that because it makes my Dell position worth more. So I like the fact that VMware is going up as well because obviously as a Dell shareholder, I own 81% of VMware. I've traded this ARB for years. The way I've always traded is if VMware goes up, I know Dell usually follows suit to the, to the tune of usually never 81%, but the tune of 50, 60%. So when VMware goes up 2%, Dow usually follows about 1.2%. I've traded that ARB, just day traded around it for years as well. The ARB bots were probably in force last night looking at this and trading it and maybe not considering the implications of, you know, what could potentially happen here. So I challenge why, like on a normal day when VMware is up 9%, Dow would only be up about 6 to 7%. But because this is obviously benefiting Dell directly, that relationship gets thrown out of whack. So we don't know what they're doing, but whenever there's, you know, whenever you do, and this isn't risk garb, this is obviously, you know, just looking at the arbitrage of the holdings against what they have. But whenever you're looking at headlines that impact an arbitrage relationship, you've got to be careful trading those, especially when there's a lot of unknowns. So at this time, I'm not really trading the relationship. I'm just flat out long Dell still because I feel like the Dell stock's undervalued. With that being said, maybe they just sell it back off again because it seems like every time Dell pops up, they just find a reason to sell it back off. It's been a couple, dog for years. Couple, couple things here. Uh, first of all, a, a question from Gary off subject. Why are you called Triple D? And uh, I thought everyone knew that. His middle name is Dale. So it's, now you know uh, everything about me. Yeah, it is triple three D's. D's. Yes, three D. Uh, number one, number two, and I can't remember when this was. And I, this is just kind of like a broad, you know, um, just about trading aggressive, being non-aggressive. When was it that you were trading that arb, and you put it on, and it like it immediately blew out on you? And you, and it, can you remember where that was? There was news on it. It was a number of years ago. So obviously maybe. Dell stock has only been out there for a couple of years. So I can't remember if we look back at the charts, maybe we can find it. And you got, and you, and you said, man, and, and you took a loss. And I remember. Yeah. Cause said, I always traded and I, and there was some type of news. I don't, I can't remember what the news was, but it, it messed with the arbitrage relationship. I feel like this was years ago though. Like I'm trying years to ago. Through. Well, Dell, but I know Dell? well, well, Dell, when Dell used to trade and then they took it private. Remember? And I got impacted by that too. That was after the financial crisis in like 2011 or 2012. Yeah, no, no. And then they was... brought it back again. And they brought VMware. Um, they had VMware Technologies, is what it was. So um, it's funny, you know, all the years go by. And I know. I, I'm just well. trying to make I th- a point. I think it was a different stock. Like, so they had done something with VMware Technologies and, because VMware always didn't trade as oh. VMware. Was it when oh. they wasn't EMC involved in this too? Well, yeah, EM. Well, that's where VMware originally came from. Was EMC? EMC owned VMware, so this is like the love triangle. <laughs> v, VMC owned EMware, and then Dell bought EMC, and then Dell ended up going private, and EMC obviously was off the board then as well. And then they brought back back VMware. Okay. I think it used to trade under VMWT as a tracking stock. 
for their VMware shares. And then there was DVMT. It was no, it was VMware and DVMT. There it, it is. It was the Dell tracking yeah, yeah, stuff. Okay. Yeah. And then they were gonna take that back, and that's what blew out. So it was the DVMT. Do you remember okay. arbitragers out there? Remember trading the DVMT, and I used to do those against the VMware. And then they brought Dell back, and now the relationship has just and DVMT used to just follow VMware very, very closely because it was basically the tracking stock for VMware. And which is ridiculous to think that you have a stock and then you have a tracking stock for it. So it was, I think, DVMT, I think. Was that it. was it. And it like oh. it was and I'm just giving an example here. I think you said it traded like between three and five, three and five. And so you shorted it one day at five and it immediately went to eight. And but you you just kind of like you scalped out of it. And you, I remember you calling me saying, man, this, this spread is really getting weird. I think a lot of people are stuck and ended up going yeah. from like eight to 16 or something. You know, oh no, it blew out huge. It blew out like yeah. 30% in one day. It would have just murdered some arbitrage traders right. that were trading off of that. And that's just it. These are still free trading investments and they can get really funny. But when you have a headline that affects the relationship, potentially you got to be careful trading that flat out relationship. So just saying, Oh, well, VMware goes up 10 points or 10% Dell should only be up seven. I'm going to short Dell. Um, that's the wrong call because this is different here now because this is impacting the relationship. You don't mind company fundamentals don't matter specifically if we're like VMware had a good report. Well, Dow's going to be up on that. But it's when there's a, a news headline that affects the the trading relationship. That's when you as you know, an arbitrageur in that relationship have to be very aware. And in this case, Dow really took off. And if you were just flat out putting it on off the hop. You're losing money because normally Dow is up, like I said, about 0.7% of what VMware is. I've traded this for years. So usually when VMware is up 9%, Dow will be up 6 or 7 Well, Dow is up 13 So whatever bot was doing that right off the hop is probably under some water there. So where it goes from here, we don't know because we don't know exactly what they're doing. They just said they're looking at options. So until we actually see what they are doing, then we can do some math on it. So now it's all speculation on well, maybe they're going to spin it all off and maybe we're going to get this value out of Dell that's been sitting there for years. But what does that look like from a tax implications perspective as well? So there's a lot of unknowns here still. And for me, like when you were tweeting it out and I, you know, and I saw the action and stuff, my, what I, I was responding was just short Dell or sell Dell just because of everything that happened in 2013. And, you know, Michael Dell is going to work this to his advantage. And it was, a, so that wasn't looking at it from a, any statistical arbitrage that was just kind of like wow that's a big move for dow i think people are going to sell it but it has sold off who knows what's going to happen we do have a guest coming on in two minutes let's try and uh let's try and bang out uh real quick no one cares about this stock but us but uh lazy boy chairs report reported after the close all right threw me under the bus there <laughs> you knew the, I was going to talk. Lazy boy. Let me, let me get the numbers. Monroe, first. Michigan, baby. Uh, Monroe, Michigan company. We all know that. All right. Lazy boy. Bro shock uh, absorbers. Q4 just EPS, 49 cents versus a 20 cent estimate. Sales of 367 versus 384 million dollars. So a top line um, uh, miss and a bottom line beat for Lazy boy. Just sitting here trying to figure out what to do. It's traded fourteen. Oh, it's just, just sitting here, really? Just sitting yeah. fourteen. Yeah, just sitting here. Pun intended. Fourteen hundred <laughs> shares have traded here this morning. It's twenty-eight to twenty-eight, twenty-eight to twenty-eight eighteen. Looks like there's a few people lined up at twenty-eight eighteen, twenty-eight twenty, twenty-eight twenty-five, twenty-eight thirty, twenty-eight forty-eight. So it looks kind of thick there, which makes me, you know, just from a mm, buck, yeah. you know, it's it's all so small though. One buyer, one institutional buyer comes in and goes, "You got them," and it could go higher. So. It's tough. This is just, you know, not giving us any indication at all. This could go either way yet. Yeah, I see. So it's flat right now. Not much pre-market action. Every time I look at this chart, I'm like, I say, well, man, if this, whenever this gets over 33, I'm going to short it. Uh, you could have done that on several occasions. And then whenever it gets under 23, even though you would have taken some heat in March, just trading range really doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Uh, rally mode, maybe 30 bucks psychological level. Um, on the downside, if anybody's trading this, uh, two day low at uh, twenty six oh nine. Uh, did Win is Winnebago out yet? Yeah, it is. Okay, stock W G O. Quick, 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 quick. I, I'm going quick. Winnebago W G O reported <laughs> earnings this morning. Q three adjusted EPS. They lost twenty six cents. Still per losing share. money. 
percent last quarter. Yeah, but they beat the estimate. They were supposed to lose 44 cents and they only lost 26 cents. So good for them, I guess. Sales of 402 for $346 million. So they beat both estimates in the quarter. Everybody's saying how awesome this company is doing, firing on all cylinders. And they still lost money in the quarter. So, yeah. I mean, this stock's went from $20 to $70. All the good news is priced in. I mean, the bloody thing's at an all-time high, at least a 10-year high. I'm not sure if I go back further than that. My chart only goes back that far, but I'm sure, yeah, let me see. It, it, it's all priced in. And and, and it's, it's still the quarter wasn't that great. I don't think it was like a, holy cow, wow, everybody's buying a Winnebago. Yeah, the sales were higher, but they're still losing money. I mean, you're losing money when you're you're firing on all cylinders. Eh, it's sold to you. I don't want it. Yeah, it's uh, it's down. It's uh, let's, I'm just looking at the daily. I don't think I get excited on the long side. Uh, double close right up to near all time high. That'd be good resistance. 784, 7084 and 7090. Your last two closes. So big numbers there. Um, on the downside, you've already lost the 6962 level. Uh, 68 is your next stopping point. Uh, you have two lows there from Friday and Monday at 68 in Winnebago. I always want to Winnebago. I just, I just know that, man, I, I mean, Lisa and me driving, me driving to Winnebago just couldn't, could not be a good thing. No, no I bet. All right. We're all getting off the road when you see you coming. Let's bring on our guest now, Paul LaMonica. He is a digital correspondent at CNN Business. Paul, good morning. Good morning. How you guys doing? Yeah, you're talking about the Winnebago results. Yeah. yeah. Did, you, did you see that? And uh, have you also thought about buying a, a Winnebago? Yeah. Where's something? Paul going to put a Winnebago? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah seriously. Not, not, much, uh, not much room in our uh, garage in uh, our co-op in Brooklyn. But, uh, hey, I mean, uh, I think people are increasingly looking at taking road trips as opposed to flying and that could be good for them i mean remember i mean the the results may have you know they did top forecast they were not great on an absolute you know basis because of the pandemic and so many things were shut down so i mean i think you know if you didn't have that you know the revenue probably wouldn't have plunged as much as it did but uh i think you're right to note that this is a stock that already has reflected the good news it's no surprise that people are, you know, as, as I joke in a blog post, it's going to be going up soon. Everyone's trying to be Cousin Eddie from National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation now. I now, love Cousin you know, Eddie. We all, we all know that, and that's why the stock was up almost 35% so far this year. So, you know, good quarter for them given the circumstances, but you're right. I think it's probably already priced in. Paul, I want to ask you about uh, something we've been talking about for years and continue to talk about is just the dominance of the the same small group of stocks, right? The, the dominance of of, of Fang, uh, and you can put, yeah. put Microsoft in that group, uh, put Apple in that group. Um, I saw you write an article about this last week, but I mean, just what are your thoughts on the fact that the, the these these group is it's unstoppable? Yeah, I mean, the, the good news is that obviously the earnings for most of the FANG companies have been extremely solid. We're seeing that, you know, Apple, you know, at an all-time high, you know, Microsoft, they're all doing extremely well in spite of the pandemic. I'm not really sure I would say, you know, because of the pandemic. Uh, and that, I think, is a reason why leadership in the market continues to remain with big tech, but at some point, you do have to wonder if more value-oriented sectors take the lead. And the bigger concern is not just a maybe a sector rotation, what happens there, but so many investors now are plowing into these stocks wittingly or unwittingly by just blindly buying passive index ETFs. So, you know, I'd like to think that anyone that thinks that they just want to own the market via the SPY ETF or, or the Qs recognizes the risk that they're taking with, uh, you know, con concentration in a handful, literally a handful. It's five stocks that dominate the market right now that that could be an issue. But, uh, you know, what happens if one of those companies has a really, really bad earnings report? Could it tank the entire sector and then by virtue of that the entire market i think that remains to be seen luckily that hasn't really happened yet well remember what happened when was it it was like june 
I want to say 2018 when Goldman came mm-hmm. out and said that like the the uh, the Fang stock group resembled a bubble and uh, yep. and the I think it was June 2018. I could be wrong. And, and the sector kind of sold off there for a few weeks and it took the mm-hmm. whole market, took the whole market with it, right? So right. You know, I mean, this yeah, is I mean, the market. The potential I... definitely for that to happen again. But I think I think the bigger issue is that I think investors can get over bearish calls from uh, widely respected firms, be it, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs or if a big uh, individual investor like a Warren Buffett were to suddenly say something negative uh, about uh, these companies. But, uh, you know, keep in mind, you know, Apple is, you know, the top Berkshire Hathaway holding right now. So, you know, Clearly, there are a lot of value investors that are finding these companies to be attractive, even Amazon. It's a small Berkshire holding, and uh, you know, Amazon's probably the furthest from uh, being a classic value stock uh, that, that there is right now. And it's still got a very pricey P.E. ratio. I mean, you just look at the, these stocks are the whole reason that the market has held up as well as it has. Because you can look, you know, and obviously we had, you know, this wicked rally at the beginning of June and some of the reopening stocks. That rally has faded. Boeing went from 150 mm-hmm. up to $234 and it's back down to 185 bucks. And yesterday, last few days, it is not rallying with the overall market. You know, the airlines right. have given back their, you know, the, the cruise lines have given back their gains. The retailers have given back their gains. The reopening trade has basically, you know, really uh, in the last two weeks fizzled out. But the market indexes continue to hold up. And the whole reason for that is Apple making new all-time highs, Amazon making new all-time yeah. highs, Netflix making new all-time highs, Google looking like it's got life and wants to try to go make new all-time highs, Facebook yeah, making new all all-time highs. Yeah, all of the things. Yeah, it's holding up the market, holding up the entire it's, market. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah. So yeah, five, I mean, six stocks holding up the entire market really right now. Yeah, I mean, when you look at what's going on, I mean, clearly there is a lot of momentum that remains in these FANG stocks. And I think, you know, the strong results speak for themselves. You do have institutional support, which does help them as well. Uh, But this is a weird market right now. I mean, we've been writing lots of stories about how day traders have come back, you know, be it the unemployed or, uh, you know, underemployed millennials sitting at home, you know, on their Robin Hood and Betterment accounts or, you know, that are day trading or, or not, whether or not there's legitimacy to the notion that, uh, you know, those, uh, you know, speculative investing is back. I mean, I think there's a certain element that you have to be concerned, not just by the fact that, the market is dominated by a handful of companies that are admittedly in solid shape, which is a good thing. You still have, you know, bankrupt stocks that are, that are popping every now and then like Hertz, you have, you know, mortgage REITs that are exploding because, you know, day traders are trying to time moves. It's, it's very, very sketchy right now. And it does remind me, I hate to say of the latter stages of 1999 and 2000, like I wrote in my story. I mean, when, you know, I vividly remember the NASDAQ going through 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 in a matter of months. And, you know, back then, 1,000-point moves from a lower point basis, percentage-wise, it, it took more to get there as opposed to getting from, you know, where we are now from 25,000 to 26,000. A 1,000-point move isn't as big a percentage uh, increase. So it's starting to become alarming how rapid the rebound has been in the market, given that we haven't had that rapid of a rebound in the overall economy, even though there are some bits of data that are definitely improving. Uh, I've been watching the SEC filings and I've watched and traded these for years. Um, And it could just be selective perception on my part, but I talked about this a week ago. And I see very few large insider buys right now. Cause I used to, I, I used to all the time, every single night, I still do it. I write down every big insider buy. I have Fox written down on my sheet cause we had some insider buying in that last night. Um, but I typically would get 15 to 20 stocks every single night. And I, you know, just from between four and eight o'clock that had insider buying. And I've been writing down two stocks, one stock, three stocks for like the last couple of months there in this whole rally, 
the insiders really have not been buying, not like they used to. And what I notice, and it could be selective perception because I don't write down the sells, but I see just huge sells, huge sells, like, you know, from insiders, like bigger than normal. Yeah. And are these people not all, never. you know, buying mansions right now? Or are they just looking and saying, you know, my stock's been on a hell of a run. It really got killed in March. It's come all the way back. I'm going to lighten up. I think it's the latter. So I feel like it's Wall Street selling to Main Street. And I feel like this is going to end ugly. And that's why I still, you know, I'm concerned with the overall market because, you know, when you look at the economy, it's not doing great. When you look at the virus, the caseload's going up. Yes, the deaths haven't started climbing, but there's a, a lag there too. It makes me just think that Main Street's going to gonna, gonna get hit here again. And they've come in here, the retail traders come in for the last two months, you know, and they've just been in a straight up market. Anybody opening their account in March is like, wow, this is the easiest thing ever. You know, Dave Portnoy, right. you, know, uh, you know, has obviously, you know, shown that, you know, where he's just been, right. you know, he was exactly. friendly buying, you know, a- airlines and they went straight up and he's done really well with mm-hmm. that. But how yeah. does this story end is the question. The... <laughs> It's a good news, bad news sort of situation. I think that the good news, which will also potentially be bad news down the road, is that Jerome Powell is clearly showing that he's kind of the old Mario Draghi, whatever it takes, quote, on steroids. The Fed will do even more than what they have done to try and prop things up. I don't think they go negative interest rates the way the ECB and Bank of Japan have done because I think we have learned that there's not much value in going negative. It, it doesn't really help you know, your economy, even if it does prop up financial asset prices. I think that Powell still has more tricks that he can pull up his sleeve. And the hope for all of the flaws in our political system right now and how how ugly things are especially in an election season i do think that congress also gets the magnitude of what's going on and that congress you know the house and senate will within you know limits you know there will be limits more so than what you might see from the fed i think they will agree to do more stimulus if they need to even if it means something that President Trump can use as a, a campaign uh, slogan or, or something to, to boost his reelection chances. The, the problem, obviously, is that you can't print money forever. There, there does wind up or maybe you can. a consequence. Maybe yeah, you can. You know, maybe you can. But, <laughs> but the, bigger, the bigger issue, though, is that to your point, and this is something I wrote about you know, way back, I think, in, in March or April, the early stages of the uh, you know, COVID-19 pandemic really hitting the U.S., The problem here is that there is only so much that the Fed and even, uh, you know, Congress and the White House can do when you're faced with a crisis that is biological and epidemiological in nature and not something that you can just fix with money and more cheap money, lower interest rates and, and stimulus. The problem becomes, like you said, if if a second wave is massive, we've already gotten evidence that you're probably not going to have people, companies and governments as willing to shut down as rapidly as they did in March during the first wave of this crisis. What happens if companies don't shut down, but consumers essentially say, well, I'm not going anywhere. If now there are concerns about a second wave, you may have a de facto shutdown because people will just stop going out. And I mean, I don't think we're there yet. And you see, obviously, there are big portions of the country where people don't want to wear masks, don't seem to feel that this is as big of an issue as it actually is. You know, what happens if you do wind up finally getting, unfortunately, a, you know, a big spike in cases in, in states and cities that didn't get as impacted in the first wave as places like New York and and Seattle. So uh, that's something that worries me that you could have a de facto shutdown, even if it's not something that is officially mandated by state and local governments and, and companies. I agree oh. with you. I, I've said that for you know, the last two months is that it doesn't matter. Like me personally, 
Um, I'm very limited with what I go out and do right now because I'm scared. I have two young kids. Um, one is very asthmatic and I don't want him to get sick. So I'm being very cautious. So maybe yeah. I'm a unique situation. But I think there's a lot of other people who are like, well, I'm just not going to go to that. The restaurant's open, but I'll let some other people go there first and get a feel for it. And, you know, if it feels safe at the end, then I'll go sit at the restaurant. You know, so it, it's difficult to just say, OK, yeah, we're going to reopen and the economy is going to go back to the way it was. And we're all just going to forget about the virus because it's going to be OK. The virus isn't forgetting right. about us. The virus is still there. The virus caseloads are coming up. I thought the second wave would start to come. I thought we'd get a lull in the summer. I thought the summer would help. But it appears that the hot weather is not helping that much because it's all these warm states that are actually mm -hmm. getting hit here already. So maybe right. the second wave comes sooner than everybody thinks it is. Well, before yeah, I let yeah, you go, I, mean, I just I just want yep, to make uh, one comment and one question. I mean, I think with uh, I kind of look at like the new wave of of, uh, of people coming into the market. I, I I mean, you can look at it as a negative way, but I kind of look at it a positive way because you're turning a whole new generation onto the markets, and a lot of their parents were caught in you know the tech bubble and the financial crisis and you know different things that happened. So maybe they're getting baptized in a in a unique environment. But I think in the long run, I think it's going to bring more investors, you know, to the market and they'll learn their lessons. So that's kind of the way I'm looking at it. The last thing I just wanted to ask you was um, we're in an election year. I mean, it, you know, and you look at like election year cycles um, in the market. Also, what's the Fed doing? I mean, it's like, you know, is the market ever really going to have it in an election year? significantly go down they'll do anything to keep it flat but just look at election year cycles you have any comments yeah i think that this is such an unusual time right now that it's hard to really figure out what the election what the market's going to do i mean uh you know, I think that, you know, if you look at the polls, obviously, uh, you know, Biden has momentum, but, uh, you know, you got to look at the calendar as well. It's uh, it's not even July yet. It's, uh, you know, still a long way away from uh, November. A lot can happen. We don't know who Biden's running mate is going to be. Uh, you know, so many things could swing back in favor of, uh, of President Trump. And obviously, there's also the issue of, what happens with uh, with the Senate? Could you know there be this blue wave that people are talking about? That you know you wind up having uh, you know uh, the the Senate potentially you know go into uh, Democratic control, uh, much like the House already is. And you know what would a uh, uh, both houses of Congress and a potential Democratic president mean for the markets if they start to you know seriously consider unwinding tax cuts? You know, that could be potentially problematic for uh, for stocks. But I think right now investors can't really look at any historical election playbook in my mind, because, you know, when was the last time you had an incumbent president as unique as President Trump? You know, even if you didn't have COVID-19, it would be a strange election cycle because we have a guy who likes to tweet more than govern. OK, I just said that. But uh <laughs> You know, we, we also have COVID-19, which obviously throws a wrench in everything, pretty much yeah. everything. So uh, it's impossible to compare this to the last time you had an incumbent president facing a challenger, which is obviously, uh, you know, President Obama and uh, you know, Mitt Romney. Uh, you really can't compare this cycle to that at all or any other recent election where an incumbent was facing uh, a challenger. All right, two things. Uh, one, I want to know why uh, Avis budget car is not going to be another Hertz. And the other thing is uh, how the little buzz is doing, man. Uh, how are they? Uh, how are you guys handling everything there in New York City? I think about you a lot with yeah, uh, you know, the young kids and stuff. So two questions, yeah, and then we'll yeah, let you go. Yeah, no, it's fine. We're hanging in there. You know, we're we're getting ready for for the summer. That's that's for sure. Uh, you know, it's the last week of school. Uh, but uh, with regards to the Avis budget, I mean, I think the good news is that, you know, they have a better balance sheet than Hertz did. The, a lot of their debt obligations, uh, the maturities are pushed off to, to 2023. There is this notion that potentially Avis would, uh, you know, benefit from not just the potential rebound as more people drive, as we talked about at the start of the segment, you know, with the you know, Winnebago results, you, you may also have uh, 
you know, them stealing some of Hertz's old uh, business as well. So I think that benefits them and, and uh, you know, privately held enterprise too. So I, I wouldn't go as far to say that Avis budget is in great financial shape, obviously, because of what's going on, but it doesn't appear that they are another bankruptcy risk imminently. I mean, if this cycle, if this, this crisis drags on for another year, two years, then, you know, they're, they're going to be a lot more Chapter 11s. We saw it with GNC this morning. Exactly. Paul Monica, digital correspondent at CNN Business. Paul, thanks for the time this morning. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Have a good one, guys. Thanks, All Paul. Right. All right. Uh, I've been writing down tickers from the chat, so let's get to a bunch of them let's now. Let's Rome. Uh, let's start with uh, 30 seconds each. Let's start with the- oh, <laughs> Dennis. Dennis. We just wasted 30 seconds. All right. Go ahead. Uh, let's start with NVIDIA. The question specifically was someone gave a level on NVIDIA, oh, they're asking, but I don't remember what level, level it was. This. So uh, I'll just get broadly your thoughts on NVIDIA. A here. trend is your friend. It keeps continuing to go up. Um, it's it's a been overdone for a while. On the and Eventually, it's going to have a wicked pullback. I'm, I'd be a buyer of that wicked pullback, though. Just like we saw back in the middle of May when the stock went from 367 to 319, lost 40 points in two days. Probably does that again at some point in time, but I don't see any reason that that's imminent here. If the stock continues to go higher, if you're if you're selling it short, you're fighting the tape. Uh, if you want to sell the old time closing high, get your offer out there at three eighty one oh seven. If you want to sell the old time high, uh, you need to go up another f- almost five bucks at, or over five bucks. Three eighty five seventy. Yeah, can't I, great even company I can't, stocks? I can't stocks a little bad about a little stock. Bit. It's run too far. Yep, for me go. to jump in here at this point, though. And not shorting it. I'm not shorting it. It's too yeah. strong. Uh, Wayfair. Next. Wayfair. Sorry, same thing. Oh, God. <laughs> this stock, oh. same story. It's really run. It's really overdone. This was the whole. And we, and you were talking about this on the pre-pre-market show. The lockdown stocks have started to run again. Wayfair was another one of these lockdown stocks. Yesterday felt like a little bit of a turning point for some of these. Um, you know, and, and Kramer even pointed it out with Fastly last night. Um, Fastly really, you know, gapped up again, but then closed weak. That's never a great thing. Closed near the lows. Um, I'd say the same for Wayfair. Uh, a couple days, blow off top maybe yesterday or two days going hit up to 221, now 206. I, I, I think I'd honestly ring the register in this, although the trend is still your friend. If you want to stick with it, have yourself a stop out under 200, though. That's uh, your, your, uh, your two day high was 2154 and sellers stepped down $6, uh, in order to uh, sell stock. So I don't think we're going to get anywhere close to that 1545 high from yesterday. Uh, if I wanted to sell this on a pop, uh, the big boys, everyone is marked at the top at 209.99. So 209.99, that would be, uh, I think the short term tops in. Yep, uh, I could say that. Yeah, and if I wanted to short on strength, I would wait for two oh nine. I'd sell rallies. My opinion, just my opinion. What about a stock we haven't talked about it for a while? C R U S, Cirrus Logic. Oh man, I haven't looked at it for a while. Yeah, me it? neither. Oh wow, why is that not participating at all? Holy macro! Is there an individual story here that this just? Because, you know, with Apple firing on all cylinders. Right. You would think they're an Apple supplier. So yeah. You would, you would think that. Uh, I mean, Skyworks is, well, Skyworks hasn't really been participating here either. So, I don't know. Not a lot of relative strength here. I, I like buying stocks that are in uptrends. This is not an uptrend. I'm out. I don't want this one. Uh, boy, this one. I don't know if we have any of my oldie buddies that uh, listen to the show. But, uh, man, they love this stock. <laughs> I don't even go how far back here. Uh, <laughs> charts don't even go back that far. 96, 97, 98. This was uh, one of the NASDAQ stocks that they really liked. And uh, it's done pretty well. Uh, looking on the dailies here, if you have to lean on something, I don't know what happened when it went down to 55, 53. Maybe that uh, was the that maybe that's capitulation. Yeah, maybe, it looks like know. that could have been the capitulation low. Yeah. I I lean on that. If I was trying to call bottom, exactly. I wouldn't want to take that out. Yeah, but um, boy, oh boy, this is drifting back towards the lows of the move. So not participating, know. never a good thing. Yeah, not participating in this tech stock, not participating in this. Yeah. Then I don't. Q's know. making new all time highs every day. The stock's going down. Something's wrong. Yeah. Next, AstraZeneca. This one is. This is all just going to be on the virus vaccine. So this yep. is the vaccine play. It's down here this morning. Oh, trading obviously is an ADR over in Europe. 
um, this is just a vaccine. If there's positive vaccine news, gonna just watch your headlines. And we know it popped like seven, eight percent that one day that they had some positive headline from the vaccine. If there's a negative headline, it'll drop seven, eight percent. So this is all gonna trade on the vaccine off headlines. Everything else is just noise. Same. I mean, major support here, but uh, headlines gonna, you know, fifty one. I like it. Fifty ninety five. I see that, and then kind of been in the trading range, and uh, fifty six has been in the trading range. But facts, yeah. I'm I'm not gonna. I like it lower fifties. I get on board with you. Fifty one. It's been it nice. Down it's there. been chugging. It's been chugging yeah. north. I mean, you got the wild card of the vaccine, positive potential news too. I mean, Kramer has said this. I believe he says this is one with Sanofi. Um, obviously, there's two of uh, both companies trying to go after the vaccine. Everybody's trying to go after the vaccine. But over in Europe, it looks like AstraZeneca and Sanofi leading the way. Uh, and Roche as well. Uh, getting a few requests. Roche private, for- though. No, it's not. It's OTC. Wow. Okay. It's not so, listed. So, so I don't trade OTC. That might as well be private for you. <laughs> might as well be private. Uh, getting a few requests here for Plug Power. They gave some plug. Really- Plug your nose. They gave some really long-term guidance the other day. Uh, yesterday morning, they, they gave Ooh, some, look at Plug. They gave Plugging some, along. 2024. Huh. They, they, they gave guidance for the year 2024. So uh, take that. That's pretty good. Take that for what it's worth. The, but, these uh, stocks, and it's Plug Power. There's three of them that trade together. PLUG, BLDP, and FCEL. And FCL has kind of just been a laggard for the group for a long time. So it's basically been Ballard Power and Plug that have been. Wait, say, say that the third one again. It was Fuel Cell. Uh, Ballard plug. Power, BLDP, BLDP, and FCEL. I've traded those three stocks together for years, although I've left FCEL off. Now, whenever I see Plug Power off, I automatically try to buy Ballard Power. So with PLUG trading up significantly here this morning, don't be surprised. Ballard Power is only up 1%. It could be up more than that. Um, just keep an eye on it because they do track each other. Again, I don't know what the news is. I don't follow the fundamentals of the companies at all. I just know there's a relationship there between Plug Power and Ballard Power. If you put the two on the chart, you can see the relationship. Interesting. Oh, big, big volume day to the upside. That favors the bulls. Continuation, I will say, pre. I look at the pre-market high. Like if you bought it yesterday and you say, oh, I just want to get out today. I would look at 752. That's your pre-market high. Look at that as resistance. Above 752, who the hell knows where this thing can go? I see it the next monthly high from August of 2014 at 837. If I was trying to buy this on a pullback, which I'm not, uh, what was yesterday's low? Yesterday's low, 597. So you're not going to see that. I guess you'd maybe have to, on a swoosh down, maybe get it unchanged, 643. That would be your support point. Remember this retail, this is a stock that has been powered by retail traders back before. And the retail trader is stronger than they've ever been because they all seem to jump on the same stocks. So this can have some wicked moves. Yeah. Wicked, wicked moves. So just flat out coming and saying, oh, it's overdone. I'm going to short it. Dangerous, dangerous game. Um, we know with the retail trader as powerful as they've been in a long time, they can really move stocks. And this is one of those retail loved stocks right now. Uh, speaking of retail stocks, uh, Innovio, this one is back in rocket ship mode. I, you know, they announced yesterday they had won a contract from the U.S. Department of oh, Defense. And this is retail. And they are driving this thing. For what? For what? Uh, this is for a... Uh, What's a contract for? Uh, the contract is to scale up manufacturing of a smart device that does something for the COVID DNA vaccine. So, yeah. Anyways, COVID stock breaks out. Hard to short a stock that's making new all time highs, at least is for the last seven years. I don't know if it was higher than that before that, but wow, big moves. Uh, Too high for me to chase, too hot to short. Definitely too hot to short. That's Nick Shaheen. (laughs) Patented from Nick Shaheen. Yeah, I always Uh, give him credit. It's a good saying. Yeah, I mean, it came off that. Looks like the, the, uh, it's come off here. Maybe see what happened. Where are we training at? We're training at six thirty-four. Someone, someone's interested under six bucks. Five ninety-two pair of lows. Wait, I'm wait. sorry. Anovia, I N O. 
I N O. I got N I O. My dyslexia is kicking no, in here. Oh, <laughs> Neil you... got downgraded here today. Oh, Neil Goldman man. upgraded at five, downgraded it. We can do Neo too because they probably want to talk about that one too. <laughs> wait, Goldman's wait, off wait, the train. Wait, That's let, concerning. Let, let's finish Inovio first. Let's finish I N O. <laughs> yeah, I say I was thinking electric car company in my head. Oh my lord. And I went to bed early last night. Uh, one, it's up a buck, trading at the highs of the pre-market session. So I would just keep an eye on that high, at, you know, right there, twenty-two ninety-eight, right at the opening bell. Good volume trading with it takes out twenty-two ninety-eight. I wouldn't want to be short it, and I would use that as target if I was long it. And then we'll go to Neo now, which I have not looked at this morning. Oh, well, we just did it. Well, you, I just did it. Goldman's off oh, train. God. Goldman gives it a downgrade here today. This, this, is, this is the electric car company, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm just, you guys are sick of hearing it, but like this electric car company stuff and this NKLA and Tesla, you know, which I am long, but I don't understand the price in it. I, I just don't see a huge need for cars. I think there are going to be less and less cars on the road. And five years from now, there's going to be less cars on the road. Ford's not going to be selling as many. Dell's not going to be. I mean, so like when people like talk about this great demand for all these electric cars and everything, I, I just don't see it. I see, I see the trend going in the opposite direction. Five to ten years, it's all going to be electric. So there's going to be a lot of choices out there, and not every electric car company is going to have a uh, you know a hundred million dollar market cap. So just keep that in mind. Um, that's all I'll say. Uh, Neo Goldman's off the train. They, they yeah. were the ones upgraded it was 470. They ran to 750. Now they downgrade today, saying it hit their price target. Um, so Goldman's Excellent. buying low, selling high. I'll go with Goldman. I'd sell too. Next. All right. So many here to choose from. Uh, FRSX. PG Gains wants to talk. It's a stock that I participated in for a while. I'm fully out of this FRSX. thing now. FRSX is a, a one of those. Uh, it, it does this, it does has software for um, the thermal imaging cameras. So there was three that were going FLIR. Mark, obviously, we know Portnoy's talked about Mark for a while, and FRSX is another one. That stock had the big pop from a dollar to two dollars. I sold most of it that day. I actually sold in the pre market at two bucks that day. So I sold higher than the high. Um, I sold the rest of it. I'm out of it now, too. So FRSX, I think the trade is over. Uh, I'll, I'll... I've never double top at it. from yesterday. That's the thing about perfect, these guys. perfect double I've top. I've never looked at it, so I'm not going to comment on it. That's the thing, though, is like in, in a normal market, you could reasonably say, yeah, the the, the high is in. But we just saw Innovio. We just saw uh, the the uh, the uh, the other one that the the o, the one what is it O N U O N O N E something U N O E uh, U N O E. I mean, these, these things that that have big moves can have big moves again. Yeah. So, they come back. The retail trader is strong, so they can come back and they can do uh-huh. another move. So you're right. It isn't normal right now because the retail trader has so much power. I think the retail trader is going to get burned here. I think they're already burned. I think there's a lot of retail traders that are down in American Airlines. I think there's a lot of retail traders that are down in Boeing. I think there's a lot of retail traders that are down in the cruise lines. And maybe they're going to pop back up and give these guys an out. But eventually, they won't give them an out. And people who are just starting that don't take losses eventually lose the majority of their money. Um, it's all about this game again. I'll just do a one-minute rant on how to be a, a successful day trader because I've done it successfully. My entire net worth has been created from day trading. So, I, you know, obviously, I started right out of university. And, you know, I didn't have any nickel to my name. I borrowed the, the money from my parents to start up right trading. And obviously, since then, you know, I've, I've done fairly well for myself. I've been profitable every single year of my day trading career. The number one reason, and Joel, you were a day trading, you managed the bright office, you've seen this too. The number one thing that separates successful traders from the not successful traders isn't that they read a chart better. It isn't that, you know, that they've got, you know, just an instinct to, you know, they win all the time. It's that they know how to cut their losers. They know that, hey, when I get down in the stock, I'm going to get out. And there's so many traders that are new to the game that absolutely refuse to sell at a loss. Those people who refuse to sell at a loss eventually have a portfolio of losers. Because yes, maybe they come back 90% of the time. And yes, okay, that one came back. And you have a 90% win rate. But that 10% of stocks that don't come back eventually start to erode your portfolio. And you'll be left with a portfolio of losers. It is inevitable. We've seen it again and again and again and again. Um, in the trading world, because as prop traders, usually people start retail and they come in and they interview and they say, I've never had a losing trade. 
Well, you've never taken a losing trade. So you just hold on to your losers and hope they come back. And in a market that continues to go up, if you're just buying indexes and ETFs, eventually, maybe that does happen. But eventually, you're going to pick the wrong stock. I think everybody who bought American Airlines at $22 picked the wrong stock. I think a lot of these companies could eventually go bankrupt. I don't think it's off the table here. I mean, yes, they did a capital raise. But I'm just saying that eventually these people are going to get caught. I think the top is already, I think it's already caught a lot of these retail traders. I don't think the retail traders are doing as well as everybody thinks they are. I think they're burned from the beginning of June. I'm just speculating because I can't see everybody's Robinhood account. But, you know, you see the list of stocks they own and a lot of these stocks are 20, 30 percent off the highs and they're just sitting on them. They're going to come back. Oh, we know they're going to come back. They have to come back. The market always comes back. Market stocks, individual stocks don't have to do anything. There are a lot more hurts out there that will put the hurt to some of these retail traders that are just buying anything and holding on. So my point being, you've got to have an out. Put on a trade, have your discipline, know where you're going to sell the stock so that you don't lose 50, 60, 80% you know, on an individual stock. Don't let that happen. I make money because I cut my losers. That's why I make money. Uh, I just want to talk real fast about the Russell rebalance. Reminder, it is on Friday. I'll put the link in the chats uh, for where you can find all the stocks that are being added and deleted from the various Russell indexes. The, there are yeah. a couple that are bigger than others here, but I'm putting that link in there now. Uh, so this this reconstitution happens uh, at the close on Friday. So Can you put that link in the YouTube chat as well? I just put it in all three places. Okay, so, awesome. Yeah. Uh, there is a there is a link. There's a there's a bunch of indexes. The Russell 3000 is is a big one. Take a look, see what stocks are being removed and added, uh, and have them on your maybe have them on your radar because they they can, are going to move. Can move. And again, like I said, I I've traded the Russell. I traded the Russell 20 years ago. You know, 15 years ago, we've always traded the Russell, and we've done a lot of different arbitrage. Uh, it became very difficult to start trading this seven or eight years ago because the the trades got crowded. So it was always just, okay, I'll buy the ads and sell the deletes, put the portfolio on two weeks before, and I'll just collect, you know, on the day of, because, and even, you know, trading them on the day of, the deletes all go down, the ads all go up because they've got to get added to the index, the deletes all go down. The trade gets overcrowded and the, sometimes the stocks go the other way. And I've seen traders just get murdered trading the Russell, like to the tune of like six digit losses, trading the Russell on the wrong side, you think the deletes are going to go down. And then on the day of, they rally the hell out of all of them. They can do stuff that is unpredictable. So the Russell is not as easy as it used to trade. The only way I trade the Russell now, and I will trade again this year, is I play the fades on the Friday close. So if the stocks are getting hammered into the Friday close, I buy them. If they're getting bought into the Friday close, I sell them. And that has worked okay. Um, maybe I'm going to get burned on it that way too, but I've been burned trying to predict that, you know, you just think naturally, oh, it's getting added into the Russell. The stock has to go up. It doesn't have to do anything. It used to do that when the Russell was, you know, when there wasn't so many high frequency traders and there wasn't so many people who were already, you know, gaming this. But now this is gamed. It is literally gamed. Um, it gets crowded to the one side. The short term traders all get long the ads and then they tank them on them to really put the hurt to them because we know this market likes to punish the short term money doesn't always happen that way. Like I said, it seems like a coin flip every year. Last year, I think that they were actually bought, they actually did it the old fashioned way where they bought the ads and sold the deletes on the day of the wrestle. It was that last year or the year before I started to get confused. What you need to know is in the small caps, there will be moves on individual stocks of 10 to 15 to 20% on some of these on the day, on, on, on the Friday close. They have wicked, wicked, wicked moves sometimes. So just be aware that if you're trading some individual name, and it is going into the Russell, it is coming out of the Russell, it can have an index effect that will, you know, that'll trump anything te technical chart that you're looking at. Great advice, as always, there, Dennis. So uh, we don't give that. investment advice, it's just you know, well, the general, way we trade things. General <laughs> advice. I'm saying that general advice is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thanks for that. Uh, I'm seeing a, a few stocks in here that, that people are, are, are repeatedly bringing up. Uh, one of them we talked about yesterday. Uh, LTHM, uh, this thing had crazy volume. Uh, we talked about it on, on yesterday's show, um, and the catalyst was that there's an offering. Yeah. Uh, so you see this kind of thing happen. Actually, you're seeing a lot of offerings right now. So big companies need to raise money. They need to raise money. A lot of companies need to raise money. So I like this. It's a Jason Raznick pick. I'm sticking with it because Jason, I think the Raz is still in. If Raz, if you're in the chat, let us know if you're still in. I'm sticking with it. A little double bottom from yesterday. It's actually back 
pretty much the place where I bought it. I bought it in the five. So obviously I should have sold it all back up in the eighth, but hindsight money's 2020. This was speculative capital. It was a half size position for me, actually less than that. That's for a third size position yeah. because it's too small of a company. So it's speculative capital. I got up like quickly 20, 30% in it. Um, it, it worked really well, but that, this is a reopening stock and the reopening stocks aren't doing well here right now. So, yeah, I mean, it, and it's like I, I think I, I think I own it at like seven bucks and change, and I uh, actually talked to, um, I like it because I talked to Gene Munster about it a while ago. He was on Gene the like show, this? but yeah, yeah, Gene likes this, and I mean, if you're like, uh, I know I like it even more. Yeah, if you're putting all <laughs> your money, if you're coming and listening to the show, and we talk about a stock, and then you're putting all your money in there, then you're totally, totally missing the point of the show and the things that we're talking Diversification about. Diversification in your yeah, trading portfolio I mean, as well. It's like, and if you ask about it 47,000 times, I mean, do we want it to go down? We're not happy it's going down, but like it's, it's part of my long-term portfolio. And if it goes to zero, it won't make any difference in any part of my life. If it goes to 50, it won't make any difference in any part of my life. It's a speculative investment. So, I mean, you guys got to you guys got to move on from this. I, I really, you know, instant gratification is not the game. Uh, it for. isn't day trading. I'm going to correct you on that, yeah. Joel. And in investing, it's a different animal. But correct. in day okay. trading, if you are a day trader, instant gratification is absolutely the name of the game. If you've got a thesis that you think the stock is going up today and you're a day trader and it goes down, your thesis is incorrect. So I will say okay. as a day trader, Instant gratification is everything. And I've never talked about that on the show, or not very often I talk about instant gratification. I don't wait for my trade to try to turn out. If I'm an investor, I, like Dell, I've been investing in Dell for years because I've always thought that they've undervalued the VMware holdings. So, you know, I'm getting paid a little bit of that today, but I've been absolutely punished for a long time because, uh, because I've sat there and obviously in that position and it's really underperformed. So, but as a day trader, I'm not going to sit around and say, okay, I'm buying this stock at 20. Now it's at 18. While I like it more, I'm going to, you know, maybe add to the loser. No, I was wrong. I cut those losers. People say, how do you cut your losers? When I'm trading on the open, I want, I've got a thesis going. Like I was trying to buy Penn Gaming yesterday. I tried to buy Penn. Why was I buying Penn Gaming yesterday? Simple reason, Portnoy, and then we're pumping the hell out of it on Mad Money. And that guy is moving stocks right now. So I'm like, he was pumping it. He, they said that their market cap, they were like comparing it to DraftKings when they were on Mad Money. And the market cap of DraftKings is $13 billion and Penn's $4 billion. And they said it should be flip-flopped. We should be worth the $13 billion and they should be worth the $4 billion. And it started to go up on Mad Money. Well, people are following Portnoy. I'm sure he's even talking about the stock. We know he owns a huge position and he talks about it. So it was predictable that it was probably going to have a good day. I actually just missed this trade. It opened at 33 and change. I had to buy um, as at 32.55. It got down to 32.59, probably because it sits in front of my order because it's a little bit bigger <laughs> order. And um, then it turns around and just ran all day. And I puked because I was like, I missed that by four cents. If I would have went 32.60, it might have topped out 32.62, 32.63. Sometimes you just have to lift the offer. But I'm busy doing other things too. I'm trading. I'm not like I'm just trading one stock. I'm trading 50 stocks. So I'm not paying attention. I threw that order out there pre-market saying if it got down and came in a little bit from where it was trading i think pen gaming is going to have a good day if i would have got long pen gaming and it would have kept kicking down i would have got out because my thesis would have been incorrect so that was the whole you know reason that i was in that one was portnoy catalyst and it would have been a fantastic trade yesterday the thing you know where i would have got it was going to be up three or four percent and ended up being up 15 percent. so i missed it I was right. I just missed the fill. I missed the execution. And, um, you know, it's disappointing. But again, I wanted immediate gratification on that trade. I would have got it. So you've, you've got to, as traders, as day traders, if you're, you know, looking at the setup and it doesn't material, you buy the stock and then it starts to go down on you, you're on the wrong side of the trade. Cut that loss and get out. As an investor, as a fundamental swing trader, maybe you're throwing a little fundies in with a little technical, you got to give it a little more wiggle room so you can give it a little bit of room. Um, you know, like even on that lithium play, I'm giving that a, a little bit, you know, because I think there's a story there eventually on the workhorse one that I'm still in WKHS, although I sold part of it yesterday. Um, that was a storied stock. And obviously, and this is one that if it started to go down, I probably would have cut the loss and moved on. But I thought the story could get hot. It did get hot. So you've got to have the thesis. But on day trading, you can have immediate gratification. That was my oh. rant. 
Okay. All right. I guess we got to be a little clear when we talk about. Things. Oh, it's it's like, up. I mean, it's yeah, your time, time frame, Joel. Trade. You're not, yep. and, and you're in a different time. Joel does a lot of swing trading, a lot of investing. He's not doing you know, a lot of you know scalping like I. Maybe a little bit in the futures, but you know, I'm sitting here and scalping for nickels and dimes. I can't be losing dollars. Exactly. Let's talk Ford real quick. I uh, got a lot of questions about Ford. Uh, it's pulled back. I mean, they had that magic run over, you know, to seven fifty, and you got a buyer here, six to six and a quarter. You got one, two, three, four, five lows right in this area. Kind of heavy, kind of leaning on it. So if you take out six, you know, considerable more downside here. But uh, trying to hold six, just kind of leaking. I don't know why the heck it got up to seven seventy four. But because uh, everything just- got ridiculously overdone, we were all going back. COVID was over. The reopening stocks were all going to go back to their all time highs, and everything was awesome. Okay. That didn't materialize, and the reopening isn't going well, folks. I don't think Ford's going back to 784 anytime soon. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry we didn't get to more of your questions. I'm writing them down. We'll address them on the afternoon show. Uh, want to thank our guest, Paul and Monica. Thanks to all of you in our chat. Uh, please uh, smash that like button for us and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. It helps us out a lot with, uh, with how we stand in the YouTube algorithm, so we appreciate that. Uh, a big, big congratulations to our own Jason Shubnell, Benzinga's managing editor, who had a baby overnight. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Shubs. Good job, Shubs. Shubs. He's not listening to the show, but. Good uh, job, Shubs wife. He's our managing editor and also resident wrestling expert and now a, a father. So congrats to. What do you, what do you have? Uh I'm not sure. It's not. I, oh, oh, I don't. I don't know. I just know he, had, he a had a baby, Joel. No, no, he had a. He, he had, had a baby. He had a girl. He had a girl. He had a girl. A girl. Okay. All right. Baby well, girl. Shubs. Shubs, man. Right. Okay. Wow. Is this baby number one? This is baby yeah. One. Yeah. Oh, life just changed all what of a sudden. What did I tell you, Dennis? Some sleepless nights coming up. I'll tell you that much. What did I tell you a long time ago, Dennis? What, what did I tell you about? Oh yeah, I remember, kid? Joel. He said. She, he said, parenting will make trading seem easy. Yeah. <laughs> and you were absolutely correct. The trading part of my life so easy compared to the parenting. I just pull my hair out trying to figure out. And obviously, it's you're learning. You know, you're thrown into the fire and you learn. So I feel like I'm a better parent now five and a half years later than I was when I started. I had no idea what I was. I never I never seen a dirty diaper until I had uh, Spencer. So I might tell him I was 40 years old before not I our Spencer, my first our Spencer, he, yeah. he changes. Yeah. His I'm not diapers. Spencer's dad. <laughs> okay. He thinks I'm his father, but <laughs> sorry, Spencer. I'm not your father. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. All right. I uh, am, please, uh, Spencer, re- I am your father. Please remember that all the information, <laughs> trading and parenting advice on this show can be used as informational purposes, not for investing or trading advice. Uh, that'll be it for us. Everyone have a great rest of your Wednesday. Joel and I will be back at 3.40. Until then, stay safe and good luck out there.